Out of 540 emails, four replies, two Skype interviews, one worked out. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing, your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. 70% of the globe is covered in water. Everyone's talking about space these days, but we haven't even mapped the bottom of our oceans yet. This week's guest is trying to change all that. Priti Bhattacharya is a 30-year-old entrepreneur who tried to fight tradition back in India, and when that failed, she moved to the United States. And after getting her PhD from MIT, she launched her company, Hydroswarm. They're building a network of autonomous underwater vehicles that can map the oceans and communicate with each other. I was curious why she's so excited about ocean exploration and what's held it back for so long. What are the challenges of building robots that can work under the sea? It turns out it's way harder than rocket science. We learn the difference between ROVs and AUVs and why they matter. We also learn about Preeti's path from feeling stuck in Kolkata to an underwater roboticist with experience with particle accelerators and nuclear reactors starting an ambitious venture. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. I want you to tell me about the time you almost got married. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's funny, right? Because... My mother actually was one of these few people who had a job and she had a PhD, okay? That was like wow. not common. Um, but I was actually very inclined to be more traditional. So when I was done with school, I just thought that you're 22 men, you're old. And <laughs> if you want to have five kids by the time you're 30, I should just start right away, right? So... I was a rebel, so I was not going to go for arranged marriage. So I secretly, you know, dated that time. What city was this? It was in Calcutta. So I, I you know, secretly, so yeah, dating. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the U.S. for my internship. When I came back uh, after school, I was like, okay, now I, now I need to get married. <laughs> it didn't work out because, you know, the guy's side of the parents, uh, guy's parents were like, they only want arranged marriage crazy that's the thing you grow up as a woman in india seeing, thinking that your only biggest goal in life is being a good wife and being a good mother and having a failure in that is like you talk about startup failure this is like a huge failure your life is over man what do you stand for like literally like that's how you feel and you know i was broken shattered i just felt like i did not know what to do because it, everything was surrounded around that guy around the boy around getting married it didn't make sense then but now when you look back the dots connect right if it never happened i would not be here today right things that made no sense when it happened seemed things that totally seemed unfair are actually all the things that connect protecting you I'm able to take rough times with much more calmly. And you just like wait it out. And I say, someday it will all make sense. Mm. Just have faith. Mm -hmm. It will all make sense. So how is it making sense to you now? What are you doing? What's the big idea? I was talking to an alumni who is in the Navy, who was talking to me about, you know, seaports, ships, and port security. And he was telling me about the story how they use dolphins to like scan ship hulls. It's called the Marine Mammal Program. I had no idea. In the seaports, you have these poor dolphins who are being trained to see if there is something dangerous. But the problem is that you can't train all the dolphins in all the ports of the world to do this, right? So it's like, wow, why don't we have something, you know, much more scalable? Why don't we have a tools? So shortly after the... Malaysian airline thing was also a lot on the news. It was during the similar timing. And it's almost 2015. And I realized, and they have spent probably about $200 million in the search operation. And I'm thinking, it's 2015. This is, there's this ocean. There's this huge airplane that got lost in the ocean. We are worried about robots taking over. And we don't even have built a tool to understand 
where a big airplane is, <laughs> that really shift my focus thinking about the oceans. Like the 70% of the world right in our backyard, we are thinking, hey, we need to go to the moon to go to the asteroids to find new resources. <laughs> but there is this whole real estate of the world that we know so little about. You know, life started in the ocean. You talk about United Nations saying like, you know, there's $24 trillion of untapped resources. So why haven't we built tools that could, you know, help us to uh, help us to basically unfold this economic potential. What were you doing at the time? Yeah, so I was a grad student at MIT. I was building this egg-shaped underwater drones for boiling water nuclear reactors. Hmm. And, you know, it's exciting. It was a, I love the robots, building the robots. But there is only so many boiling water reactors that are there <laughs> in the world. And... My greatest fear was that I will spend my entire 20s building things that would become a research thesis in the Baker, you know, <laughs> stay as a thesis in the Baker's library, right? Then I was like, okay, somebody should be solving this problem of the ocean, and why not me, right? I, I have been building these underwater vehicles, and I have the unique combination of skill set to really have a, you know, understanding of this problem. So... The idea was that, okay, if you had to collect data, a lot of data over area, why could not you put lots and lots of sensors on them? Because current solutions were all expensive, bulky, and, you know, cumbersome. What if you could make something cheap and scalable? And you saw very quickly that that same thing has happened in the aerial space, the aerial drones. Mm. Nobody thought about that, and suddenly now you have aerial drones everywhere that at low cost anybody could you know, deploy. What if you could have the same thing in the oceans, in the water? And it sort of reminds me of a, a prior guest that we had on the show, Felix Ejekum, who was working on these CubeSats and exploiting the potential for communications and imaging from space around the world. And in a way, what I'm hearing is that you're doing something similar, but in the oceans as a way of mapping, yep. mapping the oceans as well. Yeah. Tell me about how you designed the the hydro. You called it a hydrone? Yeah, you can call it hydrone. The actual name when I was in a PhD, I called it Eve. Eve. Where did that name come from? Ellipsoidal vehicle for inspection and exploration. Oh, right? scientists always like to have the acronyms. <laughs> yeah, but I also wanted it's to, cute. you know, I like a nice, uh, and I put a girly name on it. I like it. Yeah. She's cute too. She's yeah. yellow. So describe what she looks like. Yeah, it's a smooth ellipsoidal vehicle, you know, tetherless and uh, with no external appendages. And about the, uh, the size of a football? It's scalable, so it can be anywhere from six inches and I have uh, as big as 12 feet. So the one for my PhD was about eight, eight inches. So describe what went into the design, how you decided to make her that shape. You know, I cannot take 100% credit on this because it was started by my professor, Harry Osada, who first decided when they were looking at um, inspecting the internals of a boiling water reactor, which is a very cluttered and complicated environment, they want, don't want to put anything tethered in it, right? Because you can get snagged, similar as like the seaport situation I was talking about, right? So this design, we call it a control configured design, and uh, it has the same dynamics as actually of a fighter jet. In this case, you know, it's a very smooth design, so no propeller, no external appendages. That means it doesn't get snagged, it doesn't, you know, fall in a radioactive environment, then somebody has to pick it up, and you can't do that. So how is it actually propelled then? Uh, jet propulsion. Mm -hmm. So it has water jets, so you think about, if you see the picture, you see that there are holes on different uh, size. There are forward two holes, back. There are two holes on the back, two on the up, and two on the down. So they basically use pumps to push out water and use as water jets to have like five degrees of motion. So you have like all different kinds of motion. So cool. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you have in designing for underwater rather than Ooh. in space? Oh, man, so many. You know, we always talk about rocket science. Ocean science is hard. It's crazy hard. And maybe, you know, that's what excites me because I think that I have enough to keep myself busy for the entire of my life. There's lots of things I have to solve. So anyway, what are those challenges? 
So first of all, let's start with communication, right? I mean, you send something into the space, at least you get data back. You know, so far, you just have to have a tether. You have to have a vehicle that has tethered if you want any kind of like you know, live feedback. And is that because the ocean, Radio. the water is attenuating? It, it, it doesn't allow the exactly. communication to pass yeah, through? Yeah, so, you know, it's a conductive salinity. Um, so radio doesn't work in the ocean. Uh, there's no Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> you can't watch YouTube video if you're, you know, under the water. <laughs> uh, so the sound is, you know, the way to go, but it's it's limited in the bandwidth that you can, the amount of data you can send. As I said, you can't hear, you can't see, and everything fails. So <laughs> Sounds great. The, the <laughs> pressure is awful. But the electronics have to be kept dry. But if you keep the electronics in a dry place, so that means there is an air chamber mm-hmm. in it, right? Now, the differential pressure between, you know, the outside and the inside as you're going down in, you know, depth could be enough, like the gradient could be enough to crush you. So then things break. I had robots that exploded even in a, you know, deep tank testing. Mm. It's not fun. The second one is things just corrode. Salt water is just, you know, unforgiving, right? So it corrodes everything, anything it gets in touch with. So you have to find out what's the right coding you have to do. Things grow, biofalling. That is another thing. Anything that you leave underwater gets slimy. Things grow on it. And what did you call it? Bio fouling. Fouling. Yeah, Just you have to, algae and things. Yeah, grow on like it. things grow. Things grow. I mean, your skin gets very slimy and all of those things. Pretty challenging conditions. Yeah, because you know, by the time I think I got out of MIT, I think I realized there was one job I was uniquely qualified to do: plumbing. Plumbing. Yeah, because like. I would just usually go into the hardware store and just buy things that you need for plumbing and stopping water leaks and epoxy of all kind and you name it. Like I'm just always stopping water leak and tightening and grease <laughs> and lubricants and O-rings. So yeah, I can fix any leaks. So then there is currents that we did not even talk about, right? So you have to understand that what ocean this, currents, yeah, ocean currents. So what is the what is your speed, and you know how fast do you want to go? So what's the pump characteristics do you need? How do you launch this device? How do you know where it's located too? That's the so that's the biggest one, right? The ocean doesn't have a GPS. Like <laughs> I mean, let's go back to this question, right? Why don't we have a map of the ocean? So I like to say, in, you know, three steps. Well, a map means that you have a feature versus a location, right? But if you have a tool, a device that is collecting a data, you know, the device located the feature, uh, it can see the feature, but it does not know its own location. So how do you do that mapping, right? So is that sort of like you're having to dead reckon? Yeah, You, you have to kind of, you set off on a course and you know the changes over time and you're kind of guessing where you ended up. Yeah, so there's a lot of approximations that's involved. I mean, let's just say there are uh, devices that are almost cost a million dollars to give you precise positioning Whoa. that you mount on these vehicles, especially the navies would use extremely expensive units. Well, we've mapped some of the ocean floor, right? How have we done that? So some of them, again, if you know where something is, then you can base off from there that, okay, this is at this particular position. So you need to have a reference point. Once Mm -hmm. you have a reference point with respect to that, you can map it. Mm. So, you know, the Navy has done some of the mapping, and there's a lot left to do still. Wow, amazing. So you said why no map of the oceans. There's three reasons. Yeah, so the GPS is the first, right? Second is communication. So I call it the ocean data problem. First is a collection of the data from the you know, under the water, bringing the data to the surface, transmitting the data from the surface to the some central station. But now imagine if you want to distribute a sensors network to collect data, they all need to aggregate somehow and synchronize to make this map. That's not actually a very easy problem to do either, right? So yeah. how you stitch all that data in the right way, understanding all this related positioning. And then what's number three? Jeep, no GPS? Yeah, no GPS. Communications? The communication doesn't work. And the third is that the devices that you have, you know, they're not scalable. They're not at a cost and scale where you can put hundreds of them to go and collect data. 
who are some of your customers or potential customers, do you think, that would be interested in this technology? There's different markets that would totally transform if they could get data from the ocean. Fishermen, right? So farm fishing, fish farming, aquaculture. So that's a huge one. You know, wild fishing is not sustainable. So how do I grow my fishes in a way, uh, in a healthy way? But right now, farm fishing has problems like sea lice, diseases, and that's because they don't have a way to monitor this in any scalable, cost-effective way. If we could enable every farmer to get data at a very low cost and seamlessly, these people can grow healthy food for mm. the rest of the world, which is really, really important, right? Think about coral reefs. It's not only a very important marine resource, it's also people's livelihood depends on it. Why are coral reefs dying in some places? And the whole answer to it is that all of these answers depends on I need a lot of sensor data. I need to understand, okay, what is the difference between a healthy coral reefs and what is the difference where the coral reefs are not so healthy? Even to make that correlation model, right, you need to have enough data density. Uh, so how do we deploy lots and lots of sensors again mm -hmm. at a good cost and scale, right? Then the climate. What if we could understand way in advance, like, you know, when to expect, you know, natural disasters, like, okay, is there a tremor at the bottom of the, in the ocean floor, for example? On the other hand, we have national security. We have this huge coastline and there is so many ports. How do you know which ship is bringing what? You don't have to be afraid of being struck by a nuke from another country. You probably have to be more terrified about what's coming in in a shipping container because there's you know, millions of them that are going, getting into your port. How do, you, how do you monitor them? How would one of these high drones be monitoring a, a shipping container? In the, in the case of the high drone, we were looking more at ship hull scanning. Often contrabands can be located in uh, fake chambers pockets in a ship hull, and often it's not something you would be able to see visually. It could be hidden in a, around the propeller or something, in this case, ultrasound sensor, uh, that is scanning. It could beam in and see, okay, is there a hollow chamber here? And would let you know, okay, there is something to be alerted about. It seems like the opportunities are most limitless. There are a lot of hurdles for the competition. There's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity because not a lot of people have exploited the oceans as much as they could. Yeah. At the same time, it seems like as a startup, it's really important to be able to really focus and mm -hmm. figure out who your first target market is. What are you going through? What, are your, what is your thought process to figure out what functionality yeah. your drone, your AUV has as you go to market? We have a huge amount of inbound interest. So we, you know, for me, it was actually... Uh, easy to understand market because people told us what they need. So, and are you narrowing your focus based on a particular industry or a particular functionality? Uh, both. So let's just say that we see that what is a problem that is out there today that could use a particular solution right away. If I put it out tomorrow, people will just, you know, take it. So that's a very important part of it. And then you look at your technology roadmap and say, okay, where in my technology roadmap is the solution for that? And that's where your first MVP is, you know, first minimum yeah. viable product. Okay, and so we, we won't dig too much because I can tell that that's a, a little bit of a proprietary thing that you're still working on. But that is a good lesson learned is that you don't want to try to solve all problems totally. at the beginning. <laughs> totally, because, you know, when you, this is a very complex system. So when I looked at my drone and you're like looking at the different, every part of it is a, many of them are first of its kind. Nobody has built, uh, let's say a pump for this particular robot that can go, you know, 2000 meters down. So you're looking at all the different things and um, you line up your timing. Awesome. So I want to take a step back and I'd love to, to hear how you came to what you're doing. Tell me about your 16-year-old self. 16-year-old self was trying 
to prepare for the scary uh, Indian 10th grade exam. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Does everybody take that exam? Uh, yeah, and it's just like the schooling system in India is so different from here, right? I would get into trouble all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what was the schooling system like back then? Just study things from the book and try to grade as high grades as possible and become an engineer or a doctor. And if you don't become either, then your life is doomed. Unless you get married. Well, for girls, it was that. That was like the life goal. It doesn't matter even if you get a job, you're getting married and having kids. But going back to my 16-year-old self, you know, we had a couple of hours of Discovery Channel and... What I loved seeing was the Mars mission, so spirit and opportunity. So I lived in Calcutta, and I still remember that was what was most fascinating to me, was uh, watching this American television and looking at this NASA and, you know, Mars rover on this other planet, and it was mind-blowing. Like, I would just daydream of, like, becoming an astronaut one day. Uh, not so much of an astronaut, actually, to be honest. I wanted to build robots. Like, I wanted to build things that go on Mars and you know, different other planets. But I ended up going to a pretty small college in India. So that was uh, the path to MIT was not a very straight, obvious road. So I had random hobbies, which is like very strange. Um, Like what? So I, I would just read about things. The internet was fascinating to me. And I would try to get a book from my elder sisters, you know, physics book and I would like go to a random chapter and just pick up words and things and look them up. I was just a very curious person, but they were nothing to do with my school. So there was a little bit of a detachment between classes and what I was interested in. And this was in high school? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, actually, I still remember in 11th and 12th grade, I made this, you know, beyond planet Earth or uh, mission Mars Uh, science project for the science fair. And that was the first time our school was doing something like a science fair or something. What was your science fair project? Oh, on Mission Mars, on space. Mm -hmm. Um, So exploring, you know, uh, the red planet and everything that I saw on Discovery Channel. So I was always the kind of person who loves getting a bunch of people together and working on something cool. Close my eyes and I can see what it would look like when we do it. So how did that translate into what you're doing today? Tell me a story about when you you harness that same skill? Most people, in general, want to be a part of something big. Like, you know, they want to create something unique, you know, leave something behind. People want to be a part of that adventure. So if you think of, like, the Apollo uh, mission, right, a lot of engineers left, you know, whatever they're doing to be a part of, you know, making rockets, going to the moon. So money is not the biggest driver. It's always what do you like to do? What do you enjoy? Inspiration. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So if you can imagine the world that you want to live in, then you invest your time in making that happen. And if you can dream it, then you can do it. So who's involved in your project then? I have a team of engineers uh, and we are just a bunch of people who like to build things together. Ryan is he's the mechanical engineer, for example, super good at making, machining, and you know, designing things, for example. Eldon, I met in Maine, you know, bumped onto somebody who is exceptionally creative and have very complementary skill sets as mine. And he does a lot of, you know, user interface and uh, design, which is very you know, critical for us. Then we had Eric. Eric just found us. He works on scalable payment systems, for example, but he loves what we do and he could just, you know, connect the dots between what he does and, you know, the application in this. So just a bunch of common interest that brings us together. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. We'll be right back after this break. The Art of Manufacturing podcast is a collaboration with Make It in LA, which is generously supported by organizations like the LA Cleantech Incubator. LACI has a really cool facility in the Arts District of downtown LA filled with energetic startups and nonprofits. 
They offer cleantech startups flexible office space, epic prototyping labs, and the number one rated cleantech incubation program in the world. Learn more at makeitinla.org slash LACI. We're speaking with Priti Bhattacharya, the underwater roboticist who founded Hydroswarm. How did you end up in the United States? From a little college to MIT. A friend of mine, you know, he went to IIT, which is like the MIT of India, and he uh, was doing an internship in Berkeley. And I asked him, okay, what is, what is this internship? What does it mean? And he said, well, you know, you get to ride an airplane, you get to go to this another country and work in a research lab and get to make things like, you know, all this science fiction stuff. I used to watch X-Files. And I was fascinated by Discovery Channel, these two things. And I was like, wow, that sounds like a dream, like everything that I see in the TV. So it's like, I also want to do an internship. And he was like, well, you know, it's only for the top schools. It's not like everybody goes and does an internship. So I go back home and I Googled Internship America National Lab. And anything that basically said internship, even if that was a sales position, I just said, hi, I am Sampriti. I am second year in engineering. I am thinking of redesigning the Mars rover. Here is a sketch. This is a math I did. And I want to do an internship. So <laughs> after 260 emails in the first week, like literally anything that said internship, nobody replied. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten some of those emails. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so next, after another, after over 540 emails, because here's the thing, after 260 emails, no reply, you're vested. You're like, unless this is against the laws of physics, there has to be a way that somebody will hear my calling, you know? <laughs> and those are the time that, you know, you can see it. Now you're so like, you have Googled enough about the internship that it's like you're dreaming and, you know, you see it closing your eyes. So after 540 emails, four replies, two Skype interviews, one worked out. It was a matter of chances. So, you know, me being here is just a matter of crazy chances, right? Amazing. And that was the first time I actually went out of my house anywhere by myself. Really? That was the first time I even rode an airplane. Wow. And I also cried at Frankfurt Airport. I was 20 year old. First of all, because the airports looked very different. I did not expect that there would be train inside an airport. <laughs> and I had a funny reaction to that was the first time I also saw that many white people in one place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, very funny. And, you know, my first internship was at Fermilab, Department of oh, Energy, wow. doing high energy physics. Um, and particle accelerators. And it taught me one thing. I was not from the best school. And yet, I learned that as soon as you find something that you like, you can learn. And I was good at it. So I got called back again. Amazing. It changed, you know, my mentality about like, students, I mentor a lot of, you know, young girls, often there's that, oh, I'm not good in math. You know, I failed in math classes in high school. I've done terrible in physics classes. It's not like the you're not good at one point doesn't mean that you cannot learn. And so if you find something that excites you, you will figure a way to learn it. At least for me, that's how it always works. Where did you come up with the confidence to do, to do that, to apply and to get on that airplane, to leave your family behind? Oh, what did that feel like? And how did you get there emotionally? It's a strange thing. Part of you would be very terrified, but the part of you, you often realize that you have one life, right? And I think of life as almost like a video game. You have one quarter to play. You got to have fun. You have one chance and you make the best out of it. So sometimes it's not easy. It's just, you know, it takes a lot of courage, but I don't want to, you know, have my life go by and wonder what if I did not take up on that chance. Well, we say that. I think that the actual action is hard, though. You know, we may know in our hearts oh, that that's the yeah. truth. It's just terrifying. I mean, I have gone on that path and I've 
cursed myself. And, you know, when I got to even MIT, I was like, first semester was like, a, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you. I was like, why did I come here? I don't belong here. I'm getting out of here. I think, I, was, uh, I think most of the students at MIT feel that way the first semester. I was like one girl with a dozen guys in the basement lab. And my professor said, you're the slowest student I ever had. Imagine that. I was like, okay, I'm going to economics department or something. Where was this at MIT? Which department? This was a PhD program? Yep. See that I was multidisciplinary, right? And all the different majors I did. That's why today I think I'm pretty confident of at least building any system, any engineering system, I know how to build from scratch to finish at the block level. Like I know all the components, more or less, that will go into making an entire robot work from how to design it, how to do the electronics, you know, 3D printing it. It was terrifying when I started at MIT. I had never taken classes in hydrodynamics, but my two key inventions turned out to be in hydrodynamics eventually. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know. Is there a moment that you can think back to where you realized how you can tap into that confidence on will? Because I think that it's not easy to just no. always take risks, right? No, it's not. And I know I, I realized that after, especially after I started the startup, if you're starting a company, you're probably a crazy optimist. And you shouldn't do it until you are really an optimist who truly, truly believes this being your mission, your purpose, because it's hard. And for me, it was not even that, right? I'm a person who lives alone. I don't have family in here, right? I got out of school. I did not even know what a credit score was. I didn't know how to figure out health care, health insurance. I was so many things. And then you have your immigration, which, you know, is a whole different thing. Mm. And on top of it, you're running a company as a solo founder, and you have inbound from the biggest defense companies, the governments, international government. So, so much inbound. You're juggling too many things. So tell me about a time that was, you thought, hmm, I can't, can't keep going with this. I'm not sure if it's going to succeed. I think right after I came to San Francisco, I mean, I realized, you know, graduated out of school, kept working on refining the technology. Then I realized, you know, I have to now scale the startup because we have actually inbound customer. We, are, we have to launch the first product and so on. And initially, I knew nothing about, you know, venture capital. And you realize that most people in the world are not, how do I say, uh, are not as optimistic. Mm -hmm. as you are, right? They are conservative. They, are, they don't take risk. So if you surround yourself with people who are constantly questioning you, right, it can really bring you down. One thing I really, really can't stand is when people start their sentences, nobody has ever done this. Nobody will do it. Nobody will give you this, right? That like annoys me. Like you can never do this. Why? You need to find people and partners who have taken risk, you know, who have founded something, who have built something, for example, because people who have never built anything, who have never taken a risk, can never relate to you. So I often make a joke, and it's not a joke, I mean, you need everybody in the, you know, economy, in, in the society, right? There is a venture capitalist, and then there's a follower capitalist. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand, as a startup, are you the kind who's doing something transformational as something entirely new? Then you need to understand who do you need to approach. If you're somebody who is already doing something like the second Uber, the second Airbnb in a proven market, the second another scooter company, then go to people who goes by trend lines. The follower capital is what I yeah, say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're looking at a trend line, you're always you're going to be second best. Yep. These people, the original people in venture capital, took chances on things when the market was unproven. Somebody who shall remain nameless said that, oh, we only invest in companies when they already have a lead investor in place. So that's pretty common, too. <laughs> As a follower capitalist. That's right. <laughs> Tell me what's next. What are the biggest challenges in the horizon, either for you or for your industry, that you're excited to see happen? How did the world look like after we have internet? How did the world look like after you had the cell phone towers? 
I believe that, you know, a true product is the one that once you introduce to the market, entirely changes how you perceive it. So, you know, 20, 30 years hence, we should be able to look back and think of the ocean as today and how it looks like in you know, a 20 years hence. Uh, it's amazing. It's exciting, you know, that I could be in a classroom and see what's happening in Mariana Trench, right? And so what does that do for us? What does that future look like? How do you learn more about the world that we live in, right? So there is the, you know, potential from everything from the science side of things, you know, medical, healthcare, how do we plan our future of resources, food, and uh, create new markets and opportunities for people. So I often say that, you know, robots and technology don't have to disrupt, don't have to take people's job away. In this case, what I see is that technology will open up a new frontier and enable new jobs, create new markets. And that's how we really should think of technology, you know, not replacing people, but creating opportunities. Seems like a double-edged sword. (laughs) Seems like the ability to understand the oceans could help us um, help protect them and it also enables us to potentially exploit it in a bad way too. And I think, you know, again, that brings us to people being responsible that, you know, you have to think of technology as a very powerful tool, like everything, right? And you have to be responsible how you use it. After you did your internship, yeah, uh, you went back to India, but then somehow you ended up at MIT. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, I went back to India to want to get married, and I was 22. <laughs> uh, and that didn't happen. But, uh, well, the way it happened was uh, I went back to India, and I was devastated because I was 22, and I did not get to get mar- married. And then I thought that, okay, since I screwed that up anyway, let me do something that I'm utterly uncomfortable to doing. Uh, so I backpacked the entire in India by myself. I would not recommend it, but it was a turning point of my life. This may be hard for a lot of people to relate in this country. You grew up with this mentality of like a girl graduates out of college. Maybe they have a job, but the ultimate thing is you're married. You have a family. You may have kids. But what if you did not have that, did not have the family? What do you stand for yourself as an individual? And that was really... My first time, a 22-year-old self, went on backpacking trips, searching for life purpose. And I was going up in the north. You know, I wanted to go to the highest lake of India. I was on my way with a bunch of other backpackers, and there was a landslide. It killed a 1,000 people, and I was two days late. So I was only two days off. I was supposed to be there during that. And it made me realize, you know, it made me really value life that, you know, maybe there's a purpose to it. And I felt that, you know, if I put everything aside, what can I give back to the world? What is my purpose? And by that time, I had applied to the U.S. for grad school. Uh, I got, you know, funded scholarship. I got acceptance to Ohio State University and in aerospace engineering. That was all I wanted to be in ninth grade. I never thought that would actually happen, but, you know, it just fell in place. And I went back to U.S. to be an aerospace engineer. And this is when I realized that as much as I loved complex sciences, what really interested me was how could you use complex engineering to solve a problem of immediate need, I love doing particle accelerators, but what excited me was when I found that, oh, you can use this particle accelerator for making a much more efficient nuclear reactor. It's called accelerator-driven subcritical reactor. And now I was solving a problem. Now it made me so much happy because, you know, the, in the other case, you're like, well, I'm searching for a particle and I don't know when I will find this. <laughs> Now it was like, okay, what is the problem? So there is all this nuclear and radioactive waste that's standing as white elephant, and we don't know what to do with them. But what if you could have a machine that could not only take this waste, transform them into less harmful things, and also produce energy out of it? So that work I did as a master's student was quite impressive. And 
I also was a huge fan of Tony Stark. Yeah, Iron Man. So, you know, that was everything. I mean, in a sense, I was in that phase of my life where he was everything I want to be. Mm -hmm. So I was making this nuclear reactor design. In the meantime, after also another 200 emails, I ended up working for NASA. I got to work on like, you know, autonomous flight controls and did a bunch of really fun stuff out there. So that got me to MIT to build this nuclear reactor. And so what do you do in your all your copious free time? <laughs> so basically, ah. you've, you've, <laughs> you've been an aerospace engineer. You've created particle accelerators, <laughs> nuclear <laughs> reactor, uh, robots, underwater uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. In my free time, which I haven't had... <laughs> to do any other hobbies. I am I love doing what I call is cyber cloning, which is like uh, the thing that interests me other than underwater drones. I didn't, I wasn't sure if we should go down that path. Oh, but that's kind of crazy. That. <laughs> but it's, what is the deal with your, you wrote, you wrote articles about cyber cloning. Yeah. So actually started with, oh, yeah. uh, it was my answer to Fermi paradox that why don't we see, uh, why can't we find another living beings in the space? Why don't we see it? I'm fascinated by the fact that, you know, we, I think probably we live in a simulation and eventually we will upload ourselves in the cloud in a digital world. Well, we can we can include a link to your columns about that in the notes so people can sure. read about it. What's the one piece of advice that you wish you had known when you were starting starting out and you might want to share with our listeners? Help people short circuit some of the things that you've already learned. In my 30 years of life, you know, one thing I've learned, something like appreciate the value, the integrity of a jagged path. And there is not always just one right path to the goal. Forget trend lines. Forget, you know, how everybody says something is done. You have your own journey. As long as you get to the goal, it can be really a crazy <laughs> path to get there. But have faith that if you really want to get there, it may be totally unique how you do it. But if you really believe in it, you will get there. I wrote a 320-page thesis of my PhD, but I swear that I was in the middle. I was like, there's no way I'm going to finish school. But I got there. So really, it's, uh, it's important to believe and embrace, you know, your own journey. Mm. How can people learn more? Go to our website, hydrosform.com, or uh, send us an email at info at hydrosform.com and send us questions or anything that you're curious about. Do you do social media? Yeah, search for Iron Woman. Okay. Thank you. It's been really inspiring to hear about your journey and also learn about the opportunities that we have in the ocean. I think a lot of times we take it for granted and we don't really even realize that it's pretty much an, a, it's a blue ocean right now. <laughs> it's an open slate. Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. I think the three most striking things I learned today were first, the ocean is a huge opportunity. $24 trillion. But it's also really hard to explore. I didn't fully appreciate the complexity of building devices for the oceans, from the pressure and corrosiveness to the challenges in communications and navigation. Also, it was fascinating to hear about her background in India, the expectations of marriage and motherhood, and that story about almost getting caught in the landslide during that backpacking trip. Crazy. Just even going on that trip alone, I can't imagine how countercultural that must have been. And finally, her stories of not knowing what a credit score was and all the hurdles she had to face as an immigrant really spoke to me. Both of my parents are immigrants. They're so grateful for the opportunities they found in the U.S. But it certainly wasn't easy. And I believe there's something about the DNA of an entrepreneur and of an immigrant willing to leave everything behind in their home country, which is probably why a quarter of businesses in America are started by immigrants. You can tell Preeti is an optimist, and you might say she's lived a charmed life. And I wonder, does the optimism lead to good luck, or does the good luck lead to optimism? She seems to have an abiding faith that we'll all get to our goals eventually, and we just need to trust the jagged path. My only difference in opinion is that it might not be about trusting you'll reach your goal. It's about trusting the journey. 
I mean, what if she had stuck to her goal of settling down in India and having kids? You can't be too attached to the outcomes, especially in entrepreneurship. But maybe it's worth trusting that wherever you end up is where you belong. Time to wrap it up for the art of manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we speak with another inspiring pioneer taking on their next big venture. Please tell your friends about the podcast and make sure you're subscribed so you'll never miss an episode. For show notes, visit www.artofmfg.com. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with your thoughts and ideas to feedback at artofmfg.com. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with Make It in LA and other partners. Visit makeitinla.org slash connect to sign up for local LA events and news. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.